For now, Smothers knows his fate, 50 to 100 years in state prison. Detroit is a cold city, and I'm not just talking about the weather. According to CBS News, Detroit was ranked the number one most dangerous city in America for 2020. As you can see, the city is a breeding ground for killers, and Vincent Smothers may just be the most ruthless of them all. Similar to Dexter Morgan, he felt no remorse as he was primarily asked to take out other criminals, such as drug dealers. He went from an honor student to a hitman for hire. In this video, we're going to be telling his story. But before we get into the video, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Vincent Smothers was a good kid. He came from a two-parent household located on the east side of Detroit, along with his seven siblings. Vincent was an honor student who, for the most part, made the right decisions in his youth. He and his friends committed small crimes, but nothing compared to their more serious peers that are already fully entrenched in Detroit's drug trade. Then things started to go downhill for the Smothers family. Vincent's father was diagnosed with a rare form of lymphoma and therefore unable to keep a tight watch over his children. His older brother Dion wasn't able to stay away from the enticing life of fast money and began hustling drugs. With the Smothers patriarch in declining health, life drastically changed for the whole family, especially the gifted Vincent. Vincent and his sister Keila walked to school together every day. The two of them were not only close in age, but also were close friends. Vincent felt protective over his sister and made it his duty to make sure she arrived at school safe. Vincent had good reason to worry as life continued its downward trajectory for his family. His brother Dion burgled a house in the neighborhood. A man named Grady Hudson was close to the home's owner and began to threaten violence upon Dion anytime he saw him on the block. One day, Hudson saw Dion and a friend pull up to the Smothers' home. He went into his house and grabbed two revolvers. After an argument with Dion's friend, he fired a single shot towards the ground in front of the Smothers' home. There was a scream. Hudson didn't see Keila follow Dion outside to say goodbye. She was hit in the stomach and died hours later. The death of Keila had a profound effect on Vincent. Then, just eight months later, his father succumbed to his illness. Vincent was lost. He would skip school and his grades plummeted as a result. His level of criminal activity increased. He went from minor thefts at grocery stores to stealing cars. The death of his father and sister had turned the soft-spoken young man cold and callous. His mother said he progressed into more severe crimes after losing the two people closest to him. His mother's life would forever change when his friend introduced him to Leroy Payne, who worked for Delano Thomas. Thomas was a man known around Detroit because he worked for one of the biggest drug suppliers in the city. One day, Smothers and Payne were hanging out with a group of people when this question was asked. How much would you kill someone for? Smothers didn't take the question too seriously and threw out a figure for the sake of conversation. Payne agreed to the price. Ever the dedicated worker, Smothers did the job a couple of months later, on July 1st, 2006. Smothers walked up to the home of 33-year-old Willie Watson and shot him dead while he smoked a cigarette on his porch. Smothers was still working his day job and thought that Payne would shorten the money. When Payne delivered a shoebox with the full amount, Smothers began to take this line of work seriously. Eventually, Smothers was asked to take a $3 an hour pay cut and decided to quit his job. He continued doing hits for Payne and Thomas. In the summer of 2006, Smothers was hired to kill a dealer named Adrian A.D. Thornton, who had been feuding with Payne's boss, Delano Thomas. In 2000, Delano's crew allegedly stole some marijuana from A.D. and shot him and his girlfriend. In retaliation, A.D. and his brother killed one of Delano's people. Now word went around that Delano had put a $50,000 bounty on A.D. and a similar one on his best friend, Motorhead. One day in August, as the Smothers was watching, A.D. emerged from the house laughing and talking with Motorhead. In the street, a group of kids were heading for the basketball hoop, and Motorhead barely noticed a tall, light-skinned man among them. As he jumped off the porch, he heard gunfire and felt himself get hit. 
He took several bullets to his stomach, two to his head, and one through his arm. AD died at the scene. Smothers said that Payne paid him the same day, before either man learned that Motorhead had survived. I saw Motorhead's brain, Smothers told the police. I couldn't believe it when I heard he was alive. Smothers said that Payne wanted to make sure he didn't repeat the mistake. That's why the other scenes needed to be so gruesome. Smothers said I'd been paid to kill a pair of brothers, but I'd only killed one. The hitman waited five months to finish the job. Smothers said he returned to the same east side area where he'd killed Adrian Thornton and waited in an abandoned house until Carl Thornton, age 29, pulled up. As the victim got out of his car, Smothers gunned him down. Vincent Smothers dealt only with his friend Leroy when negotiating hits. Leroy worked for a man named Delano Thomas, known on the street as Leno, who in turn worked for drug kingpin Adaris Mazio Black. Black was convicted in federal court of orchestrating a scheme using Chicago-based concert tour buses to shuttle drugs and cash around the country. The FBI searched the buses in April 2007 and a federal indictment named two bus drivers as having cooperated with authorities. A month later, Smothers said he got his third job, killing two bus drivers from Chicago. The U.S. Department of Justice accused Black of paying Smothers to kill the two drivers. Brown had told the two bus drivers to meet him on an east side corner. The plan was for Smothers to meet them instead and kill them both. But as Smothers was driving to the location, he said his car broke down. He continued on foot, calling Leroy to tell him he'd need a ride. But as he spoke with his friend, Smothers spotted the two targets. Their car had also stalled and was pulled over to the side of the road. Smothers said he continued his cell phone conversation as he executed both men. Marshall, age 64, was shot as he looked under the car's hood. Smothers said he then fired through the windshield, killing White, age 56. He walked away. Smothers said his fourth assignment from Lano was to kill drug dealer Clarence Cherry. Smothers dressed in a suit for the occasion. This time, he brought along an accomplice, Lakari Berry, whom Smothers later called a fool. The two broke into a house on Gravier Street and demanded to know where the money is in. What Smothers said was a ploy to make people think robbery was the motive for the killings. But Cherry wasn't home. Only his girlfriend, Gadria Webster, her friend Carissa Rice, and two children. Smothers and Barry ordered Webster to call her boyfriend to lure him to the house. She complied, and where Cherry arrived, Smothers and Barry shot him 20 times. They then shot Webster and Rice. Rice survived, but the head wound left her blind in one eye. As Smothers and Barry escaped, someone jotted down Barry's license plate number. Police tracked him down, and he was charged and convicted in the killings. Barry, who was sentenced to life in prison without parole, never mentioned Smothers' involvement. This one is the craziest situation of them all. On September 17, 2007, Smothers took an accomplice to the house of Michael Robinson on Runyon Street. Smothers and his accomplice w walked onto the porch when a man opened the front door. Smothers, equipped with an AK-47, saw a pistol near another man sitting on the couch and opened fire. They saw more people in the house and sprayed bullets around the room. When the two men thought that the house was clear, they left. When the police got to the crime scene, they found four people dead. Michael Robinson, D'Angelo McOrneal, Brian Dixon, and Nicole Chapman were all killed. A woman and a small boy survived the attack. The craziest part about this whole situation is that an innocent 14-year-old boy with special needs was the one charged with these murders. The name of the boy was Devontae Sanford. Sanford was emotionally impaired and blind in one eye. The night of the murders, he walked over to the scene while police were investigating. When a cop saw him, Sanford told the policeman that he knew who was responsible for the murders. Sanford was taken to the police station and was pressured into confessing to the killings. He later recanted his involvement or having any knowledge of the murders. 
On bad advice from a lawyer, Sanford pled guilty to the charges and was sentenced to 37 to 90 years in prison. In fact, the only evidence they used to press charges was a drawing of the crime scene that Sanford supposedly drew that only the killer could have drawn with such accuracy. However, one of the police officers admitted to lying under oath and with the holding that he was the one who drew the photo and not Sanford. Smothers would confess to this crime, but due to embarrassment, the police hid his confession and tried to suppress the egregious mistake that they made. As a result, Sanford tragically had to spend nine years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. He's now suing the Detroit Police Department for a violation of his rights. Three months after the Runyon Massacre, Smothers killed Rose Cobb, the policeman's wife, and afterward he couldn't get her out of his mind. The case was in the papers. The officer, David Cobb, was arrested and questioned, and not long afterward he hung himself in a suburban park. For years, Smothers had murdered with little remorse. His work as a hitman had been contingent on a careful ethical dodge. He didn't believe that he had the more high ground, but as he saw it, neither did his victims. He experienced Rose Cobb's death differently. I don't remember the other ones, but I can still see her moving, screaming, and stuck in that seatbelt, he said. He decided that this would be his last job. Killing someone he deemed innocent had upened his sense of self. His mother's daughter was only three weeks old when he carried her out of his house to the store. As he walked outside with his baby in his arms, police swarmed in on him and ordered him to the ground. An officer took the baby from him. Another officer put him into a squad car. Once in police custody, Smothers confessed to everything. Smothers was sentenced to 52 years in prison for his cooperation, avoiding a life sentence. He confessed to 12 murders in a year and a half long span. Let me know what you guys think of the situation in the comment section, and please be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.